That's it, mate. And then turn left. Turn left. It's a big silver beer and big grey door. That's it. Here you are. Look, come on. There you go. Johnny boy. <laughs> Whoa, look at that. That's nice, isn't it? Hey, eh? mate. Johnny Michael. Smith. <laughs> How are you, buddy? I'm good, chap. I'm so pleased to see you. Have you got somebody coming with you? No. No, just this. Just this. Oh, mate. Seriously, I can't tell you how disappointed I am. Why? Because every time I've seen you do your late break show and you've sat down and interviewed somebody, they have the big comfy leather seats to sit in. Shut up! Shut up! <laughs> you got the seats in here! Yeah, no look. way! Yeah, look. What have you broken it off? Uh, well, there's been... Hang on. Hang on. Let me, let me lock <laughs> it. <laughs> Work out how to open it, Johnny. No, there's no way you've got a seat in that little... Po <laughs> I've, I've modified them. I've had them modified. They By fit. cutting them up into yes. one foot cubic squares. <laughs> and put, could you not just have chose a different vehicle? I got bored with big vehicles. <laughs> put them in a coupe. How many laws have you broken driving here? I, with... don't, I don't know if there's a load limit on a, a GR86. It's not so much a load limit. Um, you can't see through the rear screen, can you? I don't know if that's... It's got mirrors, the mirrors are... Mirrors work, yeah, because it's like a van with a coupe kind of yeah. van. A very small coupe kind of van. Yeah. Right, uh, you go and have a really elaborate breakfast while I assemble the chairs. No, I'll help you assemble the chairs, but you need somewhere to assemble them, so yeah. uh, let me just welcome you to the Brewer House. Oh. <laughs> Ready, Johnny? <laughs> yeah. Ta da <laughs> Wow. It's all right. It's like a car cathedral. Oh, I like that. I like that. Hold that thought, car cathedral. Yeah. Uh, and I thought, you know, I was in preparation for it. We'll put the chairs around here somewhere. Yeah. So should we go and get them out of the car? Yeah, let's get the chairs out. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> how did you get that in there? I don't, can't remember. It's, I'm, I'm used to just, I'm used to it being difficult. Shall I just say that? There you go, look. I'm used to just things being a little bit difficult. That's ridiculous. <laughs> you absolutely desperately need a van. <laughs> got screws, got an Allen key. You've got a windy screwdriver to do it in. Not electric, I'm old school. Just... What? No, we're going to be here forever. No, I think there's an, uh... yeah, there's an Allen key in there. The assembly is extremely self-explanatory. Arrow points up. I've put an Allen key in there, but it's much easier with one that has a ball end so you can use it at an angle. All the bolts go in easily. If one starts to lock up, turn it backwards and try again. There the instructions. All that for this. Yeah, all that for a disappointing brown <laughs> chair, hey? For a beaten up leather chair. I know, but... But there's something really cool about them, isn't there? Is that where you want it? I don't know where I want it. I'm so tired. I'm well, just, just tell me and I'll... We're here with the brown chairs in the car cathedral owned by this man, Mr. Mike Brewer. The, the car TV man. Well, that's nice. I think there's plenty of car TV men out there. I'm just one of them. You're one of the um, veterans. That makes me sound really I'm odd. pretty sorry for that's, doing that. That's, you know, there's a, a race that happens every year in November called the Veteran Car Rally. London's and a they are for vehicles that are 1904 and before. Yes. So calling me a veteran makes me, sort of dates me I, of that sort of age and period. You're not a pre-1904 guy. There's no brass on me, let me tell you. Yeah. I'm pure metal. <sighs> <laughs> I'm I'm I, I I'm intrigued to have this chat with you. I am. And, yes. to, and thanks for helping me assemble the oh, chairs. No, it's all right. Yeah, they're good. It's uh, it would have been easier to get a van here, Johnny. Yes. Can take I take the blagging van? Can I can I take it? You can take the black van. I'll take the V4 home. It's a lovely van. <laughs> I think the first thing I want to do is ask you about, and this is something I didn't know about you until really recently, despite the fact I've known you for something like twenty years. Is that as a as a child, your father was was in the car game, and I didn't know that he built custom cars. Uh, yeah, he was quite 
famous in the custom car world. He built um, several cars that made covers of magazines uh, and got notoriety out there. He did. Uh, he worked on uh, Pimble Wizard for Mickey Bray, which was a, a very famous car. In fact, there's a car that's still being copied today. People copying yeah. a unique hot rod. It's kind of weird that, you know, hot rods meant to be individual personalizations of your own interpretation. Yeah. And yet uh, it, this one gets copied over and over again. Uh, he did Renegade, which was a C10 pickup truck, some like it hot, Marilyn Monroe uh, tribute car. Um, this was it, 70s. It was in the this. 1970s. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Um, I can remember going on the Chelsea cruise was it the last Saturday of every month we'd do the Chelsea cruise up and down the King's Road? It was absolutely amazing with all the other custom cars and hot rods. And it was really like being in the scene of American graffiti, you know, back then. Yeah. It was a, it was a very, very special moment growing up with my dad. And it meant for me that I had no choice in terms of falling in love with cars. It was sort of instilled in me. Yeah. You know, this is the family business. This is what we do. You're helping. <laughs> and uh, uh, during the summer holidays, that was my job. I would be down the workshop helping my dad. Did you, did you like modern cars and old cars, or were you gravitating towards...? I wasn't gravitating towards any cars back then. This was just life. You know, it was a way to hang out with my dad, uh, do some cool stuff, watch him weld, paint, fabricate. He was an airbrush artist as well. Uh, and it was just a cool time to sort of just hang around with my dad. Yeah. And I really didn't know what I was doing. I was just doing it. It wasn't until much later, you know, until I got to the age of uh, 15, 16 years of age when I bought my first scooter uh, and then my first car. It wasn't until I got to that sort of age that I realised that I knew all this stuff about cars. I knew what to look for, how to look for it, what would be wrong with a car, what would be right with a car, because... I'd just been around it all my life. You know, my dad, my dad, in between the custom cars, he would fix normal cars, yeah. you know, and uh, he would do his own cars. So I just got to, to learn it. I got to learn the car trade, but without knowing I'd learned the car trade. <laughs> and so by the time I got to, uh, to 16 years of age and bought a scooter, which fundamentally is a, you know, a two-wheel version of a car, um, I realised that I knew how a scooter worked and when the carburetor blocked up, how to take it apart and clean it out and how to change the spark plug and why the suspension was squeaking on the scooter and why the brakes weren't tight. And I just knew stuff yeah. and um, it never phased me. I just sort of got on with it and learned it, learned it at a very early, very early age. And it, it put me in really good stead, uh, really good stead, so much so that by the time I was 17 and bought my first car, a Mini, um, I, I'd sold it for a 500 pound profit. What? There was a reason I sold it for it. I it had a little prang. We repaired the prang, but I had an insurance payout. Uh, so we managed to improve the mini uh, yeah. with the insurance money. And then I sold it for a 500 pound profit at a time when my parents, 1980, my parents would have been probably only earning, you know, 400 pound a month. And there's me making 500 pound as a 17 year old out of one car. Yeah. And I sort of, it was a light bulb moment went off in my head. I went, oh, I'm, I'm quite good at that. I, I could do that again. I can do it. I can do that again. So yeah. that's uh, what, what set me off on the path of buying and selling, buying and selling, buying and selling. And uh, it's brought me to my car cathedral. See so what? you're like an accidental apprentice. Uh, yes, actually, I am an accidental apprentice. Um, I mean, the car trade is a, is a funny trade because... You know, I've grown up from the, in the car trade in the 1980s, 90s, noughties, uh, and I've been, and I'm still in the car trade today. You know, yeah. I've still got my own business, Mike Brewer Motors. Um, and the, the cars are forever ebbing and flowing in terms of technology, styles, yeah. what people are looking for. So it's it's you're forever learning. And um, so I'm still, and I still consider myself, after all these years, I think I've been buying and selling cars 45 years. I'm still an apprentice. I'm still learning the game. And you're not bored of it yet? No, I'm not bored of any of it because, as I say, it's a new adventure every single day. You know, yeah. I, I still get so excited. You know, this transit van there that you just mentioned, I still get so excited. The thought that I could 
buy an old commercial vehicle and it's bloody wonderful and exciting and brilliant. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's just, uh, there's nothing else in the world, other than my family, yeah. uh, there's nothing else in the world that would um, excite me in the same way that, that, uh, than cars. So do you, you do, I know you obviously do it on TV with wheeler dealers, but in your own time, when you're having a bit of quiet time in the downstairs toilet, let's say, are you sniffing around looking for a deal? I'm, I'm never looking for a bargain. I'm, I, I never. My, Michelle, my lovely wife, she says, when you get a day off, have a day off. You know, sit in the garden, do something. But no, this is my workshop. It's got two ramps in it. There's a full tool chest over there, uh, and I've got all these toys to play with. So on my days off, I'm down here. Put a car up in the air, take the wheels off, have a look at it. What is your therapy? Actually, I was going to ask because I know I do know how hard you work. Yeah. You are one of the hardest working people in this industry that I know of. And, and, and people can criticise you for lots of things, because people will, and we'll come on to that. But you are bloody hard working, Mike. And I do wonder, like, how do you switch off? I don't. I never do. I never have. Um, I'm 100%. Uh, I'm f I don't know. There's something about me that's just flat out. I've always been flat out. And I love work. I love hard work. I like people, you know, that's my, my biggest uh, vice really is, is people. I love being around people. And I built a team around me uh, with my crew, my camera crew, sound recorders, Simon, Nick and John, plus the team that I'm working with at the minute on Wheeler Dealers. I, I build these sort of teams around me that I sort of, I'm so passionate about them mm. working with me and the things that we can achieve together that it means that I become a workaholic. I work flat out uh, to make their dreams come true as well. They want to make the best shows and they want to do the best things. And so um, work becomes everything in my life. And, yeah. you know, if it's, when I say people, it's not only the people that I work with. You've seen me at live events, like the classic car show at the NEC. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll have thousands of people come and see me. At a, a, a <laughs> get cross, hounded. I get hounded at that weekend. Um, but I will spend as much time as I'll make people bored and walk away. <laughs> I'll spend as much time with somebody as they want um, because I love people as well. I like being around people. I like listening to people's stories and, and that is work. You know, that's me working when I'm out there doing that. And yeah. uh, I, I just love work. So I'm a, I don't switch off. If I was to do one thing to switch off, uh, one week of a year, one week of a year, Mrs. B might drag me to, uh, a bit of sunshine. We went last year, we had a week in Cyprus and on my week off, I tried my hardest to not look at the phone or a laptop. Yeah. And uh, I, read, I read insatiably. So I read about three books in a week and I like reading autobiographies of other successful uh, people and, uh, and I like to get inspired. So uh, that's the only switch off I'll do. So you do read a lot? I read a lot. I'm an insatiable reader. I write, you know, I've written for a living as well and uh, and I'm, I love reading I like to read uh you know stories I'm a I'm a I'm a big story reader I'm uh, you know I read a lot of, if I start a book I can't stop a book you know I'm a yeah it's like watching a Netflix series you know if it's a good one you're in you're in you yeah. know I will wait until say Ozark or Breaking Bad or something I'll wait until it's all out there and then watch it yeah. because it's a page turner. Yeah. You know, I'm going to go through. I'm going to go through the, the next episode, the next episode, the next episode. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I'm like that with uh, with books, and I'm like it with people. I'm like it with work. I just flat out. You are flat out. Flat out. I mean, I get tired looking at what you achieve. <laughs> frankly, um... it's it's not easy. You know, all of it is not easy. It's exhausting, and I'm balancing a lot of things all at the same time. What are you balancing right now? Let's go through what you're balancing. Okay, so right I'm now. balancing a TV series, which I not only present but I produce as well. I balance a car dealership uh, that is very successful and uh, sells hundreds of cars each month and has a large employment uh, base. How do you do that? Just those two things. <laughs> people. Good people around you. Really good people around me. Um, I uh, am at the moment renovating, which is a you know more of a personal thing. But me and Michelle have set about renovating. If we're not renovating cars, me and Michelle have got a passion together of renovating old houses. And we've done quite a few in our lives, um, but we've taken on the monster of all renovations. It's a, an 1865 uh, manor home that's tumbling down. 
and we've set about restoring it and it's killing us. It's literally killing us. Uh, but it, what is, how big is this place? It's 12,000 square foot, sits in five acres. It's got 15 bedrooms. It's ridiculous. Shit. <laughs> and it's shit. <laughs> it is shit, Johnny. <laughs> is it, is it a falling? And it's listed? It's uh, now been listed because the uh, lovely Secretary of State of England has decided that when I bought it, it wasn't listed. That was the attraction uh, to buying it because yeah. I could do lovely things to it. Um, but since I bought it and I put a post up on the internet say I bought this house, uh, the Secretary of State noticed that post and said, oh, that's quite an important house. We're going to list it. No. So without consultation, uh, without permission, uh, I don't get a say in it. They've now listed it. So uh, everything that I'm, I'd like to achieve with the house, now I can't. It's because r the ridiculous listing culture in this country, in a country where we're told to be more green, more efficient, better up for the cycle. environment, upcycle, I now have to go and find horsehair and yak's milk to rub against the walls rather than plaster uh, because, you know, that's what the Secretary of State would like me to do. I wanted to talk to you about life prior to Wheeler Dealers. Yes. Because obviously Wheeler Dealers is what you're best known for. Mm. It's probably your most successful TV show. But I remember first seeing you on, I'm sure it was Deals on Wheels. 1997, Johnny, you would have been the kid. 1997, I would have been 18. 18. I would have passed my driving test the year before. So Deals on Wheels was a show that um, fell into my life uh, back in 1997. It was about people buying and selling their cars at home and I was uh, narrating what was happening together with another guy called Richard Sutton. That's right, Richard. Richard, and we would guess what the cars would sell for and write on the windscreen. You had a big pen on the windscreen. On liquid yeah. chalk on the windscreen, yeah. we would guess. I reckon it's gonna make 350 quid. Yeah. And um, uh, that was the highest rated show in Channel 4's history. Was it? Up to date, yeah, you know, yeah. but Channel 4 was only like, you know, a couple of years old then. Yeah. And uh, it was a massive success. It was a huge success. So much so it, it led on to me being headhunted by Top Gear. Right, okay. Of which I turned down. Yeah. And you glad you did that? Uh, well, I turned it down twice, actually, Top Gear. So the first time I turned it down because it was rubbish, basically, back then. <laughs> it was Angela Rippon. <laughs> I think it goes back that far. Yeah. Um, you know, it was Goffrey, the Goffrey period, probably. Chris Goffey, Woolard. Yeah, Clarkson. Very young Clarkson. Yeah, I, he. it was the period when, to, to 19, must have been 1999, uh, around then, 1998, 99, it was the period when Jeremy Clarkson left the first time. Yeah. And uh, I got uh, approached and asked if I wanted to have the first eight minutes of the programme. They were going to give me that. Uh, of which I went with that information to Channel 4 and said, I've been approached by the BBC. They want me to take this show and do the first eight minutes. And Channel 4 went, no, we're going to give you your own Top Gear. So that's when we uh, devised Driven which right. was such a big hit for Channel 4. It actually almost knocked Top Gear off the airways for a little bit. It was, it was a bit. good show, really good show. It was a massive show. show. Yeah. Uh, ended up working with our, our good friend, uh, Mr. Plato and Penny Mallory. Yeah. And uh, we just had such a laugh making that car show. And it was, it was such a successful format. It was a great show where we tested the cars in a rating system. Yeah. Uh, and we would award them points at the end of each program, and then you'd end up with a, a group test winner. We'd test three cars against each other, and you'd end up with a winner. And in the last iteration of that, uh, when there was no Top Gear, and uh, I'm quite proud of saying this, because tell me if it sounds familiar, uh, the last series of that, we had a studio on an airfield yeah. uh, where we had a live studio audience. Yeah. We had three cars that we would test against each other, we had a test track outside the I, studio where we test the cars. I don't know. I, I can't, I can't yeah. think of where I've seen this. Where, where you've seen that before. And that was the last series of Driven uh, that we did. And then um, Top Gear appeared on TV in an airfield with a live studio audience and test track outside. So um, I'm quite proud of that, you yeah. know, to think that we inspired that, which was good. Yeah. And uh, that second kickstart of Top Gear... I was also offered the job then. Uh, it, it 2001? 2001. Yeah. I was, uh, went for a screen test with Jeremy Clarkson. Wow. Renault Aventine. And uh, I 
we actually had a bit of an off, me and Jeremy, together. We knew each other, but we had a little bit of an off, but it was a good off. It was like a real bantery, you know, fuck you, no, fuck you, fuck you kind of moment. It was really good. <laughs> you, put, you probably st you stood up for yourself, right? I did stand up for myself. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to be d called, you know, Pillsbury Doughboy and o Oaf yeah. by that knob. Yeah. So, um, no, I gave as good as I got, really. Yeah. It was great. It was brilliant. Andy Wilman and Gary Hunter again, this is the best TV ever. You two are great. Um, but, no, we, we decided we'd kill each other, uh, yeah. probably. So, um, uh, at the same time, I, I was offered this show on Discovery Channel. Uh, this little weaning network, tiny little network, who said, come up with a car show. So, together with uh, two guys, Dan and Mike, um, we devised Wheeler Dealers. And uh, I thought, no, I'll go on my own path yeah. and do my own thing, not knowing that, you know, when we, we sat and... You devise these shows and put pen to paper and, and think you've you've come up with something, you know, that's going to make a series. You know, we're only happy to make a series. Yeah. Uh, little did I know that it would go on to become the world's biggest car show and I'll still be making it 20 years later. That's the thing. Nearly 20 years. 20 years, yeah. You're still doing the thing. It's I guess it's, it's, yeah. not, it's a good thing, right? We it's, just got the figures this morning. Funny enough, global figures this morning. And uh, it's the second highest rated show on Discovery Networks that plays out to 250 territories now. 252 territories. It played in 238 territories last year. Wow. And just last series alone, just the last series in the last year, uh, has played out to over 52 million people. Bloody hell. Around the world. So it reaches over 200 and 250 million people around the world, um, which is kind of, cr I can't, still can't get my head around it. It's crazy. Well, when you, when, when Wheeler Dealers went from the UK to the States, yeah. I remember l looking at that going, oh, that's interesting. Because, you know, it'd been around for whatever, 15 years or something, or 14 years, I can't remember. But, and I thought, I wonder what it's going to do. And it just suddenly took off again. Soared, yeah. And that's the thing, you know, you think about it, you know, we got a lot of stick for that, you know, only from the Brits saying, you've, you know, you've ruined the show by taking it to America. Yeah. But think about it from the other side, you know, we've been making wheeler dealers in the UK at that point, 13 years. You know, I'd bought as many cars in Grimsby and Hull and, you know, South London and the East End as I could possibly buy. I've done it. You know, we've, we've covered it. Yeah. And then you get a chance to take this tiny little show that you help create. You get a chance to take it to Hollywood. Yeah. You know, and you go, what? I beg your pardon, what? You want me to put the show in? Jesus, how proud <laughs> does that make this Britishman, you know, that yeah. we can take this little program and, and put it in, in the mecca of film, you know, yeah. Hollywood. And yeah. we did. What was that like? It's just Because you had to nuts. live out there. We lived out there for six years, yeah. Was it, was, it, it was nuts. It was... It was arriving into Hollywood and immediately, uh, the moment we got there, it was, you know, the first series we did in America was with Ed. And the moment we got there and landed, uh, we were stars. You know, people knew who we were. They, they, you know, they went, oh, you're the Wheeler Dealer guys. And the crew and the people that we worked with were excited, you know, from Hollywood. They'd just been working on a James Bond film or working with Beyonce <laughs> on a pop video and there they are excited to be coming to work on these these two idiots from from Wheeler Dealers working on this car show wow and uh, everyone wanted it on their CV and everyone was trying to get a job on Wheeler Dealers it was it was a really exciting time for us to know what the impact we'd made for me and Ed it was so exciting and uh, of course you know we got to live on in the sunshine of California for six years I lived on the beach you know, literally on the beach for six years. I yeah. spent 360 days of the year in shorts, T-shirts. It was bloody wonderful. We'll come on to when you came back to the UK, yep. which is why you're sitting here now. But when you, when you were in the States and you'd go to these car shows and, like, you're sort of superstars in the, you know, in the, the biggest car-consuming community yeah. in the world, really, yep. isn't it? Um, did it? Did it get tiring? I mean, did, like, because obviously you, you and Ed... Inevitably, I've got to discuss Ed. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I honestly don't really know what happened. I still can't work out what happened. But was it, did, did you always want to come home or did you think I'm, we might live out here permanently now, depending on what happens? Oh, no, I knew it was never going to be permanent. Yeah. I knew it was a 
this was a job that we were doing yeah. and it was great why it lasted. I'm truthfully, uh, although it's been fantastic being back home and there is a reason why we come back home. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's been, it, I'm really missing it. I'm really missing that car culture out there. It's a different culture. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a much different attitude than we do to cars and to their love of cars. And it's something that I find really refreshing with American people. You know, it's part, it's almost part of their birthright and their, 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 their DNA. independence. Yeah. Yes, they are, when they're born, they are told they're going to work on a car in a garage with dad. You know, whether you're a boy or a girl, at the age of eight, you're going to be in the garage with dad working on his old classic. Yeah. And almost by default, every house in where I live, particularly, they would have a modern SUV, a Ford Explorer on the driveway, but in the garage would be an old Mustang or an E-Type Jag or, you know, something. There'd be that. a, yeah, or that, yeah, an MGA. <laughs> uh, there'd be an old car in the garage. Yeah. And uh, they'd be working on it at the weekends with their kids. And, and their love and their passion for cars uh, is what excited us. You know, it's what got us there in the first place uh, because they love the show. Yeah. And it's what excited us when we got there because it, it comes across, you see that, when I'm out there buying cars, you can you can see the passion with the people. Plus, it's different. You know, it's a different culture to buy cars in. Uh, they talk differently to you about their about the way that they've treated a car. You know, here in England, we would, you know, if I smack that Porsche and you come around to buy it, you know, you're never going to say, "Oh, by the way, I pinged it into a tree once <laughs> and I pulled it out." In America, they go, "Me and my brother, we went down the road, we smacked it into a tree, but don't worry, we pulled the dent out." You know, they'll tell you. Yeah. And it's kind of refreshing to hear that, you know, in America. Yeah. So, uh, they yeah, give you all the information. Go, going to the States and making the show there was a massive deal, not only for the network, but for us. And to know that when we got it there, it just succeeded. It, it was, it was fly, it flew. And it still is, you know, it still plays on in America. And it's, it's flying out there. It's, it's a very proud, I'm very proud of that. Very proud that we took this little show and put it on a global stage. It's like when a band breaks America. Correct. It's just like and that. And it just we, goes up another. Yeah. We, you know, Top Gear broke America with its, with its uh, shows out there. And it was hugely successful. And, you know, by, <laughs> there was never a car show I didn't rock up to where somebody didn't walk up to me and go, do you know Jeremy Clarkson? And I go, yes, I do. They go, oh, you know, and it was, yeah. it was us and Top Gear. You know, it was Wheeler Dealers and Top Gear. Yeah. That's all they spoke about. You know, they, they absolutely adored uh, the Britishness of our, our two shows. So this could be, this is like a two part question, I suppose. Trolling. Yep. Of which there's been an, an enormous amount. Yes. And I honestly don't know how you kind of cope with it because it seemed like there was like a tsunami of it when A, you went to the States and B, when the whole thing with Ed kicked off and Ed stopped working on the show. So talk to me about those two things, if you can. Uh, yeah, trolling, uh, when we went to the States,